Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what we refer to as the synoptic Gospels. Now, what do we mean by synoptic? Well, uh, synoptic comes from a word soon, a Greek word soon, meaning together or with, and, the, and the, the adjective optic or visual to see. Uh, there's another verb, ophthalmite, means to see. And so the idea is the synoptic Gospels we see together that are similar. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar in their content. John is very different in its content to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. How could three Gospels written by three different individuals, and the liberal scholars would say, not Matthew, Mark, and Luke, other individuals, how would three different individuals, given an account of the life and works of Jesus Christ, how could they come to the same outline of events and similar content? The Synoptic Gospels at times have similar content. However, at other times, they have differing content. So the Synoptic problem is answering this question, how do we account for the differences and similarities? How do we account for them? Now, we, as believers in the inspiration of Scripture, are going to account for them in a different way than a person that does not believe the Bible is inspired, that does not believe the Bible is authoritative. A word about biblical criticism. Around the 1950s, many liberal Bible scholars were attacking the character of the Bible. They were attacking its inspiration, its inerrancy. And they were saying that the Gospels could not have come to the same content, similar content, unless they shared a similar source. Boltmann was the most well-known of these, and he would say that you had to demythologize, in other words, you have to take away all the legends of Scripture and try to find the real Jesus. And so he tried to do this, and, and many others did this, and attacked the authority and inspiration of Scripture, and said, basically, not believing in supernatural, right? So if you don't believe in the supernatural, you have to come up with a humanistic, naturalistic explanation for how Matthew, Mark, and Luke could have so much similar content and such, and at the same time, different content. Okay? And so these are the two vantage points we're going to come from. The, the biblical, conservative, and when I use these terms conservative versus liberal, I'm not talking politics. The litmus test, the test of whether you're a liberal or conservative, the biggest test is what do you believe about the Bible? Do you believe the Bible is inspired and authoritative, inerrant? Then you are conservative. Do you believe that the Bible is not inspired, that it's not authoritative, that it's not without error in the original manuscripts? Then you are a liberal. The Synoptic Gospels, the issue is um, the Bible, the New Testament, the Gospels record a lot of miraculous things, right? All the miracles that Jesus performed, Boltmann and others would say, there is no supernatural. Only what the mind can conceive of can be true. They have to come up with a natural explanation of how these gospel authors are similar, gospel accounts are similar in their account in a manner that does not require a supernatural God. The definition is the belief that there is no supernatural, only what the mind can conceive can be true. This is from the rationalistic perspective and approach to the scriptures. But we believe that the Bible is not just a human document, right? That's what a liberal scholar would say. It's just a human document full of errors. Let's look at the similarity of material in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Again, uh, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels because there's so much similar content. So the left column here is all the similar content. So Matthew has 58% of its content is similar to what is found in either Mark or Luke. That's a lot of content. So Matthew, you can do the math. Matthew then is only 42% original or unique. Okay. Mark is 93% similar or same. That's a lot of content, and that's why they would argue Mark was written first, right? 
Because Matthew and uh, Luke would then have taken information from Mark and would have added to it. Um, but they would say Mark was written first, and that's why there is so much content that's also found in Matthew and Luke. Okay, so 7% they would say is unique material, or we would say is unique material, unique to Mark that's not found in Matthew or Luke's gospel. Well, Luke's gospel has about 41% similar or same material. Uh, There may be changes in some expressions or words, but the same or similar accounts, same or similar events, um, and so then that's 59% unique material, okay? And so that's why we call these the synoptic gospels, because 41%, 93%, 58% is similar content. Now, when we get to the Gospel of John, it is not considered a synoptic gospel, soon, with, or together, an optic to see or vision or visible, uh, because only 8% is similar or the same as Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so 92% of John's gospel is different. It's not the same. And for this reason, many of us believe John was written last. By the time John writes, he's aware of Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account, and so he doesn't duplicate it. He adds new content, new uh, information that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not emphasize. Okay. Now, turn with me to John chapter 20, back to uh, John chapter 21. The very last verse, chapter 20, uh, 21, verse 25. So John tells us that there are much more, there's much more information surrounding the life of Jesus, surrounding the teachings of Jesus, surrounding the miracles of Jesus, that he does not record, that he does not include. And so John says, if we tried to include all the works and words and miracles and events surrounding Jesus' life, not any, no books could contain it all. And so we must recognize that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are choosing to select information for their author or their audience, for their recipients, that suits their purposes, right? So John includes, it's all inspired, it's all from God, it's all truth, but John includes truth that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not. He was aware of Matthew, Mark, and Luke's writings by this time. It had probably been copied and passed around and distributed, and they were, he was familiar with it. And so he chose to emphasize content that his readers would not otherwise know if he didn't include it, okay? And so John tells us at the end of this that I can't even include everything. Um, No book could contain all surrounding the words and works and life of Jesus Christ, okay? So there is similar arrangement of material. Here in your notes, you have uh, John the Baptist's ministry. This is the outline of events here, baptism of Christ, the temptation of Christ, the ministry of Christ in Galilee, the end of Christ's public ministry in Jerusalem, and so we see a, uh, the same outline of events that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are centered around. These events. Of course, you would expect these are the most important events if you're doing a chronological, historical account of Jesus' life. But the liberal scholar doesn't necessarily think all of that is historical, right? So they have to explain how could the feeding of the 5,000 be in more than one record, more than one account if it's myth, if it's legend, if it's not true. One of them came up with it, or they came up with a a source that was same. Right? They have to give a humanistic and natural explanation that does not account for an actual miracle. Healing the leopard in your in your in the leper in your notes, the question of Jesus' authority are found in all three gospels. The request for Jesus' body is found in Matthew and Mark. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic Gospels because they contain a lot of similar content. They follow the same outline of events. John's Gospel does not. Okay, there are um, similarity in two Gospels also. Um, so some go- sometimes Matthew and Luke are in agreement. Right? Sometimes Matthew and Luke have the same content. Um, sometimes... Luke and Mark have the same content, but Matthew doesn't. 
Okay, so there are certain events or certain historical accounts that are recorded in two, but not all three of the Synoptic Gospels. So now the liberal has to decide how could it come, how does this happen? Unique material, especially unique material in Matthew and Luke that's not found in Mark. Where did they get that information? Well, we'll continue to talk about that. And so there's similarity in two Gospels, and you have a list of some of the similarities in two of the Gospels. But there's also um, divergences or unique material in the Gospels. How do you account for the unique material? Um, For example, Luke's depiction of Christ's lament uh, over Jerusalem before the triumphal entry, Matthew's depiction of Christ's lament over Jerusalem after his triumphal entry. The birth narratives of Matthew and Luke are quite different, right? So how do you account for these differences? That's on us, right? As believing in the inspiration of Scripture, this is where we need to be honest with the text and come to a conclusion that uh, correlates both passages, both Matthew and Luke. The, The liberal has no problem saying they're just human errors, right? It's just human document. Well, there are explanations for this. Uh, each gospel has unique material not found in other synoptics. Matthew records Peter walking on water, Sermon on the Mount, etc. So the synoptic problem is dealing with how they have the similar content, uh, same outline, but also, at times, unique content and unique information. Okay. So the liberal response. Well, the liberal starts with a different presupposition. The Bible is not the word of God, and it is with error. Or it is not without error, if you want to put it positively or negatively. This is the starting point of the rational mind. This is the starting point of someone that does not believe in the supernatural and doesn't believe in the miracle accounts of Scripture. We must realize that. We're starting very two very different places. And so the liberal response is, one letter must have been written first, They usually say it's Mark, the second copied from the first, and the third plagiarized from the first two, okay? And so that's how they give an account, that's how they explain how all three Gospels could have a story of a miracle of Jesus performing a miracle um, and include all, all three included. They have a common source. They all go back to the same source in their view. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not write their respective Gospels, but rather unknown writers in the second century. So what do they come up with? Okay, they call it the mutual dependence theory. And so they are trying to account in a rationalistic way for this supernatural occurrence. Well, um, so this is how it's usually explained. Mark was written first. And Matthew and Luke came from Mark, right? And then there's this theoretical source called the Q source. Because uh, it was a a created, it was a theory uh, established in Germany. So Q stands for quella, and it it means source, right? And so um, they would say that Matthew and Luke got their information from Mark. Mark was written first, and Matthew and Luke copied or edited or plagiarized from Mark. But then there's unique information found in Matthew and Luke that's not found in Mark. So where did they get that information? And then there's this hypothetical source called Quella. So no one has ever found the Q source. There is no Q source, in my opinion. Uh, It will never be found, uh, because it's trying to find a naturalistic explanation And so they're trying to say, well, Matthew and Luke have a lot of similar content. They're talking about some similar miracles. Where did they get that? How can we explain that? Well, they say there's a quella, there's a source, there's a common source. It's hypothetical, it's theoretical. We don't own it, we don't possess it. There is no manuscript for it. But it's the source that Matthew and Luke must have both used in putting together their... um, the gospel. What about information unique to Matthew? Well, then there must be a Matthew source, referred to often as the M, and then a Luke source, referred to often as the L. And so you can see how theoretical and hypothetical uh, this is. Right? And they'll go to great lengths uh, to deny the historicity of Scripture. 
So explain the similarities, uh, a biblical conservative perspective. How do we, as those that believe in the inspired scriptures, account for these similarities? Well, we must first realize that our presupposition, our assumption, our belief, based upon evidence, but our belief, our starting point, we don't go back and try to pre- reprove this every time. We, uh, we've assumed, we believe this to be true. It's like a mathematical given. You don't need to go back and prove it over and over and over again. You believe it. You've been convinced of it. You've been persuaded of it. The presupposition of the conservative Christian is that the scriptures are inspired and inerrant in their original manuscripts. So the Bible is inspired. God breathed. God passed it, gave it to us through men of God, speaking and writing the words of God. And so that is our starting point. And so we don't have to explain away the supernatural accounts of Jesus' miracles. We don't have to explain away how Matthew, Mark, and Luke would have recorded events that they witnessed because they actually happened. And so we don't have a problem explaining those. That's a problem that the liberal has. So we believe that the gospel authors were recording actual events that they witnessed by themselves, not second century people pretending to be Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These are actually Matthew, Mark, and Luke, first century observers, eyewitnesses, or in the case of Mark, uh, recording the eyewitness account that Peter passed on to him. The record of the same event should be, of course, similar. You'd expect similarity in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So Matthew was a disciple of Christ and therefore wrote as an eyewitness of Christ. Okay, Uh, Mark based his gospel on the testimony of Peter, who was an original disciple and an eyewitness of the life of Christ. Luke wrote, consulting several eyewitnesses. You can turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, Luke himself says that he consulted many sources. But he's using source in a different way than the uh, liberal theologians are using the term source. In Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, uh, Luke tells us that others have undertaken the responsibility to do a gospel or to record the events surrounding Jesus' life. Um, they are handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses. So Luke says, I was not a personal eyewitness to all of this, but it's been handed down. And verse 3, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. So Luke explains that he consulted eyewitnesses of the events that he recorded. He records a biography, he records a historical narrative of life, teachings, and workings of Jesus Christ, but he does so consulting eyewitnesses. Could Mary have been one of those eyewitnesses? Well, look at Luke chapter 2, 19. How would Luke know this? Unless God uh, told Luke this, or Mary told Luke this. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart way. Luke is speaking as if he knows Mary's thoughts, right? And Luke probably consulted Mary, as well as other eyewitnesses of the life and events surrounding the life of Jesus. Luke, being a medical doctor, could investigate very carefully and record uh, very uh, thoughtfully the events surrounding Jesus' life. And so um, they did use some sources, um, but not sources in the same sense that the liberal scholar speaks of them. They're actual eyewitnesses, not a common written source. So a biblical response. One, there's oral tradition. Back in the time in Judaism, they passed down a lot orally, and they memorized a lot. That was their method of learning, memorization. And so an oral passing down, remember it's several years after Jesus' death that they're recording this. But certainly followers of Christ were memorizing, were repeating, and were sharing uh, what they had heard firsthand from Jesus' own mouth as eyewitnesses. Second of all, they did have sources. They, not in the same sense that the liberal scholar speaks of them. But Matthew and Luke probably consulted the, 
the um, ge genealogical records of the temple. The temple had genealogical records because they wanted to see who could fulfill the line of the Messiah if the Messiah would come to the scene, right? They could consult that to see the genealogy recorded in Matthew's gospel, the genealogy recorded in Luke's gospel. That was probably a source. It's any theory that rests on such extensive invisible evidence, Q, M, L, manuscripts or documents, should immediately be suspect. Any theory that's based upon hypothetical, theoretical sources that have never been discovered is only a theory that can't be proven. And so I think the liberal is on very shaky ground, very difficult ground. Uh, different recipients, a biblical conservative says, no, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are writing about the same life to different recipients. Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience, Mark to a Roman audience, Luke uh, to a Greek and Gentile audience, and so they're going to emphasize different things from different perspectives about the same accounts. Each gospel author is writing from unique perspectives, and each source or each eyewitness is its own unique perspective and person. The divergent accounts can often be reconciled when one understands that Christ often taught the same message on numerous occasions. A particular message or two or three or four are ones that resonate, that are important, that you're going to share again in a different audience with the same needs because that message is just as pertinent to this audience as it is an audience in this other city or other church. Well, the gospel doesn't change, right? And Jesus emphasized and shared a lot of parables about the kingdom. Those don't change. And so uh, it's not uh, a big step to say Jesus might have shared the same uh, message on more than one occasion. Similarities and differences in narrative accounts can be accounted for simply by understanding that each writer was describing the same events from different perspectives with different audiences in mind. All similarities and differences can be accounted for. We don't need to be afraid as Christian conservatives. There are explanations for anything you find in the text. As a matter of fact, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. Scores of archaeological findings confirm in clear outline or in exact detail historical statements in the Bible. And I just want to stop to encourage you, uh, and I love biblical archaeology, and we taught that for the first time in second year this year. And you know what? God didn't need to give us all the biblical archaeology that he gave us. And in fact, before 1948, before Israel became a nation, and there's more stability in the Middle East, there, there was a whole lot less stability before Israel was a nation. But before 1948, there's so little by way of archaeological um, discoveries. They said there's no such thing as... as uh, as David. Well, the, tell, the stell of David that says House of David was discovered. They say there's no such thing as Solomon. Well, a kingdom in Hatzor, Gezer, and Megiddo have all uh, confirmed what 1 Kings 9.11 says about Solomon building fortified cities in Hatzor, Gezer, and Megiddo. And so, you know, not many believers had access to all of the archaeological evidence that we have. You don't need to fear inspection of scripture uh, there are explanations and we can you know, if truth is on our side and it is we don't need to fear it's an inspection right so the synoptic gospel is one of those areas that uh, liberal scholars have attacked uh, and we have good godly scholars uh, who have responded to all of the uh, accusations that have been leveled at the scripture what are the portraits? In other words, how is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John portraying Jesus? What vantage point or what description of Jesus are they giving? Well, Matthew, writing to a Jewish audience, uh, focuses on Jesus as the Messiah. That is what the Jewish audience is interested in. Is he the Messiah? Does he fulfill the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah? Mark, writing to a Roman audience, portrays Jesus as a servant and savior of all. In a Roman audience, Romans are very familiar with slaves. 
It's believed at this point there were probably more slaves than there were free men in Rome. There was a huge amount of slaves. And any wealthy person didn't ever work. All their slaves did the work. Uh, medical doctors were sometimes slaves. Lawyers were sometimes slaves. And so there was a huge amount of servants and slaves. And Mark, I believe, portrays Jesus Same information, but portrays him as a servant, the suffering servant, the servant and savior of all. Luke, writing to a a Gentile audience, speaks of Jesus as the perfect son of man. The perfect son of man. And John, writing to everyone, to a universal audience, not specifically Jewish audience, not specifically Roman audience, not specifically Greek audience, uh, audience, but to an to everyone, uh, describes Jesus as the eternal Son of God. Really focuses theologically on Jesus being the God Man, eternally God, right from the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so it, the synoptics tend to emphasize more the humanity of Christ, while John emphasizes more the deity of Christ. I'm so glad that you have chosen to join us for this class hour. My prayer is that this course and these accompanying materials will be a great resource for you as you seek to know the Word of God better and to know the God of the Word better. Maybe you know someone that would benefit greatly from investing a year of their lives to study the Word of God at our institute. Maybe you are that person. I want to invite you to learn more information about the Word of Life Hungry Bible Institute at our website. This year we have students who have come from 15 different countries studying in the English language. And we have guest teachers who fly in from all over the world, coming from some, but not limited to, Dallas Theological Seminary, Appalachian Bible College, Tyndale Seminary, Cedarville University, and the Institute of Bible Extension in Jerusalem, Israel. Additionally, we have veteran pastors and Christian leaders who fly here to serve with us as our adjunct faculty. And as a ministry, we are committed to providing this training at a cost within the reach of every Christian because we want to help Christians establish a solid biblical foundation upon which they can build a bright future for the glory of God.